else was there I could do? I gaze into those eyes and your favorite host we're back clay and lauren just doing the hosting again look at us this time we have something very important to tell you did you see all the be rich stuff in the rotunda who saw that yes okay does who does not know what be rich is a couple of you guys okay so be rich is our annual season of generosity we have some ways that we'll explain how you can be a part of it it's actually one of my favorite things that our church does because it's very outward facing it's not just like tithing where you're giving and you don't know where it's going but it's going outwards to communities and to nonprofits and people who use it. So we feel like it's a great way to empower them. Lauren, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I just think like sometimes North Point Ministries, like these churches can feel so big. And what I love about Be Rich is that it proves that we really care about the individuals in our community. And that's what we're called to do. So yes. definitely want to be a part. It's really amazing. Yeah. So we'll have more um, available after the service about how you can get involved if you'd like to. I encourage everybody to do it because it's such a cool thing to be a part of especially as a TLR ministry. But we're gonna go ahead and get started tonight. Go ahead and stand up. I'd like to pray for us and then we're going to worship together. Yes. Lord, thank you for tonight. Um, give us this moment of space right now to become aware of your presence with us, your heart for us, the ways that you are generous to us, the ways that you are upholding us. We're carving out this time in the middle of the week to hear from you, to worship you. I'm thankful that whenever we make the decision to show up, it's not wasted. This is really precious time. So would you fill up our souls if we need it? Give us direction if we need it. We look to you. This is called worship for a reason. We want to worship you. We want to adore you. We want to lift up the name of Jesus and ask you to move tonight. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's do it.
got your healing. Oh, just receive it. Receive that freedom.
a space between where I used to be and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. You sing it. There was another.
His boundaries are because of his great love for us. That discipline is because he cares. Whether you feel doubts and you, you need answers, whether you whether you need joy and it's been a long time since you felt it. The Father is all those things and more. He's all those things and more. He's even the things you don't know to ask for. And so tonight, I just wanna encourage this room, I'm encouraging myself to open up your heart, open up your mind. He knows exactly what you need, when you need it. And his intentions towards you are good. So God, help us to believe that with just a little more faith tonight. That you are good to keep your promises and that we can trust what you say. We love you and pray this all in your beautiful name. Amen. Love y'all so much. You can have a seat. Feeling? There we are. Hey guys, uh, how many of you are enjoying this little cold snap here in around the Atlanta area? Yeah. Uh, who doesn't like it? Who did I? Uh, that's a lot. Okay. Wow. All right, do you not like it because we forgot that it was fall and went straight to winter, or you just don't like the cold? You just don't like the cold. Okay. So you're fine with fall. It's just the okay. I'm just making sure that you're sane. You know what I mean? Because the fall is the best season. <laughs> it's, it's not a. It's not a debate, guys. It's okay. Uh, hey, we are really, really excited that you decided to show up here tonight, uh, here in the middle of the fall, middle of October. It is our last week of this conversation we've been having called, Did God Really Say? We're really in this series, we're evaluating truth and lies, this reality and unreality, to try to figure out where do we find our foundation of truth. That's what we've been navigating the last three weeks, and so I've said it every single time. I'm gonna say it again so you can get some extra reading if you want to, but this series is heavily influenced by a few people. The first is John Mark Comer. He's a pastor out in Portland, and John Mark Comer uh, wrote a book called Live No Lies that you should absolutely get and read. It can change your life. Massive effect on my life, but that book is a huge inspiration to this series, 
And to the other series that we did called Did God Really Say at our Buckhead location with Joel Thomas, our lead pastor at our Buckhead Church, last winter, that's what we've been inspired a lot of, all the like drawings and stuff we've been doing, that's all Joel, he's an artist. I can't draw a stick figure well, so thanks for bearing with me the last few weeks, guys. Um, but then another person last week, uh, Craig Rochelle, wrote a book called Winning the War in Your Mind. And I think that one has the power to unlock a lot for us as we navigate this series, because what we've really been trying to go after is this idea of truth because your world is filled with something that you can't even escape. You, can't, you don't have a choice. You can't get around it. The reality for every single one of you is that something is in your world all the time. It's this idea of misinformation, as Joel calls it. Misinformation is all around you. Everyone just says something, and just because they said it, it is supposed to be viewed as truth. And if you don't affirm it as truth, then something is wrong with you. And so really we want to evaluate, well, then what is truth? And what is true of what we, can, of what we hear and what we believe? And so through this lens of truth in this series, we've been really evaluating these three questions. First week we talked about who is God and is the fact that he is your ultimate authority something that you can live with, something you can trust? Who is God? And then the last two weeks we talked about who am I? And answering the question of who am I not, really, in week two with the condemnation that you can give to Jesus and the freedom that he provides for you. You don't have to walk around in the shame of your mistakes anymore when you find yourself in him, the freedom that he offers. And then last week, we talked about through the lens of who am I, of who am I really and what's really going on with your identity and where you find the source of that. And so uh, last week of this who am I thing, this is, to go back to it real quick, this question of who am I, Really what we landed on was this idea. It was a little sing-song thing that some of y'all laughed at that I thought was really clever because it really speaks to the reality of where you are. So in case you're catching up online or you didn't see last week or you just forgot, you have an enemy that we've been talking about in this entire series who is coming after you, who wants to take you out. And he does not want you to thrive. He doesn't want you to find the more and better life that God wants for you. And so what he's looking at you and what he's saying to every one of you is, hey, guess what? One, two, three, four, I declare a thought war. He's not coming after you physically, the serpent that we see in Genesis chapter three. He's not coming at you physically like a snake would. No, he's coming at you mentally. He's attacking your thoughts. And it's all a part of his strategy to take you out. That's what we've been talking about the whole time, these three circles, this diagram. Because first what he does is he gives you deceptive ideas. He does inception on you, if you've ever seen that movie. He puts a deceptive idea into your brain. And then that deceptive idea plays into a distorted desire that you have. Something that's good, something that's fine, but it gets distorted because that's all he can do. He can't create anything new. He can just distort what already exists, what God already made. And so he plays on your distorted desires that eventually gets you into some destructive behaviors. And in the middle, right here in the center, when he gets all three of you, or gets you to play on all three of these things, that's where sin enters your story. That's where sin entered humanity's story. That's where sin enters the story of Scripture in Genesis 3. And that's really where we find ourselves, is struggling around this idea of his attack on us. And so if it's ultimately with our thoughts that the enemy attacks us first, of how he wants to steal and kill and destroy your life and the life that God wants for you, and then the reality for all of us as we kind of close this series is that there are some lies that you may believe as true. You may believe them as truth. And some of them may be super silly, super innocent. Like they might seem like small little things that you've just always believed. This misinformation that we can so easily believe as truth. But because you've believed it for so long, you start to associate it with truth. And then maybe for some of you, later on you find out it's not actually true. How about this? When I was a kid, there were nine planets, and then y'all's generation lost one. You were like, I, it just doesn't exist anymore. We've only got eight planets. Where'd Pluto go? I don't know, but y'all didn't think it was good enough, so guess what? Pluto doesn't exist anymore. If you told me that Pluto wasn't a planet when I was a kid, I'd be like, no, that's not right. There are nine planets, and it's the last one. But now we've learned more of why it's actually, I don't want to go into the science of it because I don't understand, of why it's not actually classified as a planet. That's something I used to believe that now I gotta realize is not actually a factual statement. So another thing, how many of you like Coca-Cola? Show of hands. Guys, you're in Atlanta. Um, this is Georgia. If you say anything else, it's blasphemy, okay? Uh, one more time, Coca-Cola, show of hands. Okay, cool. Uh, how many of you prefer something else 
of a soft drink besides Coca-Cola. This is a safe place. It's church. It's okay. We're going to pray for you. It's fine. Now listen. Do you know part of the reason why the name Coca-Cola is called what it is? It's because back when they originally first started making Coca-Cola, I'm sure you know this, cocaine was actually in it. Did y'all know that? Did you know cocaine was in Coca-Cola? You're like, no wonder it's so addictive. I know, yeah. We call it sugar now. Back then they called it cocaine. And so cocaine was in it. Trace amounts of cocaine. Like, that's insane. But they put cocaine in it because of something that they believed. Look at what, there was an article in CNN where they did this interview talking about like what used to happen with cocaine. And look what this guy, uh, Caleb Hellerman, says about cocaine. This is crazy. So long before drug cartels, crack wars, the TV shows about addiction, cocaine was promoted as a wonder drug. It was sold as a cure-all and praised by some of the greatest minds in medical history, including Sigmund Freud. We're going to talk about Freud in a minute. But the reality is, people thought that was good. That was the belief. That was the truth that they had. And now we're like, no, that's, no, that's not, there's no way that's true. It's the worst possible thing you can ingest ever. See, sometimes the things that we thought were true need to be dismantled in the face of truth because they're not actually true. And so tonight what I wanna do is I wanna spend a few minutes talking about how some of the things that you may believe about life just need to be dismantled because those things are not going to lead to your best possible life. Because at the end of the day, that's what all of us want. Whether you're here following Jesus, you're trying to figure it out, you don't have any idea about faith or about Jesus, if it's your first time, no matter where you come in, every one of us would say we wanna live the best possible life. And so really, if we wanna live the best possible life, that's gonna lead to this last question we've been examining in this series. This idea of truth and reality as it relates to these three questions. Again, who is God? Who am I? And then today we're gonna talk a little bit about What's it mean for my future? And so, to a certain extent, what we're talking about is how you can say, I'm living my best life. And you're like, but we talked about that for a month. Last series, you're you're right, we did. We talked about how in order to say, I'm living my best life, you've got to take wisdom and apply it to your life. Because wisdom is the most valuable thing you can find. And it will ultimately lead to your best possible life. Because whenever you apply wisdom, it allows you to answer those questions of who is God and who am I. But for the next few minutes, what I want to do is I want to unpack a little bit about what you can do with that wisdom. Because this entire semester, what we've been giving you is something that doesn't necessarily mean something's changing in you. But we've been giving you something. This really is what we've been going after the whole semester. We've been giving you a lot of insight. You've been getting a lot of knowledge, a lot of insight. There's a lot of knowledge that's been thrown your way, a lot of wisdom, a lot of insight about truth and, especially in this series, about lies. But the problem, you ready? The problem with just insight is that if all we ever get is insight, we're left a lot more knowledgeable but not more changed. Just simply because we've got knowledge in our head about something doesn't mean that we actually change. And if anything, getting insight is actually probably what we just prefer. I'd rather learn about something, and the moment I learn about something, I feel enlightened about something, now I feel better about my situation. This is what we prefer. Here's how I heard it said recently, this idea of insight and why we prefer it. Uh, John Mark Comer, the guy who wrote that book and his podcast, they were having a conversation, this new podcast called called The Rules of Life. You should definitely listen to it. Talks about the rhythm of life, the way you should live, and here's what they said in their conversation. It says, we prefer insight to change. And we settle at insight and self-discovery because we don't like to transform. I wanna be settled and fixed and comfortable in my ways. So yes, I've got some insight that can inform my future, but I don't know that I really wanna change much about the way I live within my future. And that's a problem when it comes to what we're talking about. Because what the enemy was trying to tell Eve in Genesis 3 and what he's trying to tell all of us is that you can't trust God as your ultimate authority. Because what God wants for you is something that, that requires something from you. It requires you to give your life up to follow him. 
And the moment you do that, he's going to transform your life to allow you to find the more and better life than you could ever dream of. And last week we talked about the reality of that, that a lot of people, it's a lie a lot of people believe they get it wrong, but we had to right size it last week. The following Jesus isn't about behavior modification. It's not just simply about doing things better. No, it's about life transformation. And so tonight what I wanna really ask you is, what are you allowing to transform your life? Not simply being okay with just the insight, but allowing something to actually transform and change your life. What are you allowing to transform your life? But the better question than what are you allowing is who are you allowing to transform your life? Because here's how you were wired, every one of you. You were wired to follow something. You were wired to give your attention to something. You were wired to give your affection, your desire, your time to something. You were designed and made and wired to worship something. And so who are you allowing to transform your life? But really the question we gotta figure out and you gotta be really honest about is, who are you following? That's where I wanna land. Because if you wanna figure out What's the best thing for your future? How this applies to life and your future? These questions we're answering in this series. At the end of the day, what you gotta figure out, it ultimately comes down to who are you following? Now, this is a question that the enemy tried to attack in Genesis chapter three. The serpent shows up for the first time on pages. We see him show up and he goes after God's creation, everything God created, and he wanted to destroy all of it. And so the question that the enemy, that the serpent, that we would come to know or we would come to label or identify as Satan, the, what he actually asks Eve in Genesis chapter three is, hey, did God really say that? Like, did God really say you shouldn't do that? Did God really say you can't do this? What if he's holding out on you? Ultimately, what if you can't really trust him? as your ultimate authority. And so really, as we close out the series, you've gotta evaluate what action can you take from this insight we're gaining when it comes to who you're really following. Because the enemy is throwing lies at you all the time and attacking you and saying, one, two, three, four, I declare a thought war. So what is it you do with those thoughts? And basically it all comes down to what you think in terms of who you follow. Let me explain it this way. So we've been doing circles this whole series. Let's do three more. Okay, cool. You win? Great. So here's one. Here's two. That's more of an oval. Um, I apologize. There's three. That's really good, though. That one, that one wins. All right. So what we're trying, I, th yes, okay. What we're really trying to figure out is, who are you following? That's what I want to know. And whenever you're following something in life, here is typically what we think. Like, who am I allowing to transform my life? Who am I really following? And if I look at that story we've been going back to every single time in Genesis chapter three, really it seems like there are three different paths, three different ways that we could follow. And it plays into the characters that we see in the story. The first one that we would all understand and is kind of a, a given is Jesus's way. We're following his way or God's way for our life. The second one that I don't think anyone would say they would choose is Satan's way. <laughs> no one's waking up today like, I can't wait to follow Satan. This is gonna be great. I can't wait to spread evil everywhere I go. Like no one, no one in their right sane mind really says that. None of you say that. But what our world says and what so many of us say and what our culture says is there's a third path. And that third path that so many of us believe is that there's, there's my way. I mean, this is, how, this is how it really plays out, right? We wake up in the morning and we have thoughts or intentions about what we're gonna do. And we've got this, like, this picture of what our life and what our day is gonna look like. And there are some days where you make mistakes or you're not really feeling it or your emotions aren't really there. And you're like, I mean, like I know Jesus' way for me and I know I didn't really do Jesus' way when I was in that moment, but... But hey, but I mean, I wasn't doing Satan's path. You know what I mean? I wasn't building his kingdom. I may not have been building God's kingdom, but I definitely wasn't building Satan's kingdom. I was kind of just doing my own thing. Right now, I'm just kind of doing me. I'm just kind of, you know, keeping it moving and following my own path and making my own decisions and doing things my 
own way. Really, this is how we think life works, is that you have a choice. One of these three things. Who are you really following? But what if I told you that there's a problem with this thought process? What if I told you that the ultimate authority that you're actually putting your life under has to do with where you're choosing to follow? Even if you go to the next one in the back, the way that you are trying to navigate which one of these and what you're going to do is going to determine a lot of the life that you end up leading. So what I want to do is I want to challenge you with something. What I want to challenge you with is something that a lot of people believe and that is everywhere in our culture that fits very much in with one of three, these three ideas and which one you're gonna choose. And it's this statement. You ready? Follow your heart. Just, just follow, you should just follow your heart, right? I'm not, I mean, I'm not following, I'm not really following Jesus' way, but I'm definitely not following Satan's way. I'm just following my heart, guys. Like, I'm just being true to myself. I'm just, I'm just doing me. This is everywhere in culture, in case you didn't know. I Googled, like, follow your heart quotes. Sweet Jesus, the amount of things that showed up that were laughable on there, like these little wallpaper quotes that people may download. I thought I'd pull four of them that we can look at and realize how wonderful they are. So here's a few of them. Here's the first one. Break the rules, stand apart, ignore your head, and follow your heart. I'm pretty sure... I'm pretty sure Paula Abdul put that in there as a song somewhere. Where? I don't know. But um, this is what our world says, right? Ignore, ignore your head. Follow your heart. Here's another great one. If you follow your heart, there are no regrets because there was no choice. Uh, okay. So no regrets. There we are. Yeah. Uh, thanks, James. Uh, here's another one that's great. Your heart is free. Find the courage to follow it. I don't know who said it. I don't know. Some hippie butterfly decided to put that online for us to realize, like, oh, this is something I can, I can put this as my wallpaper. This is definitely gonna be true for me. And here's a great one from someone that you all know. It says, have the courage to follow your heart and your intuition because they somehow know what you truly want to become. Steve Jobs. It's great. Now, You may think that this idea of following your heart sounds right because our culture embraces this. Our culture embraces these ideas as truth. And people like our friend, our cocaine's a wonder drug friend, Sigmund Freud, even he then takes these ideas we have in our culture and he developed them into this idea that that pleasure should be your primary pursuit. Sigmund Freud and his psychology a little over 100 years ago came to the conclusion that your primary pursuit, your highest desire in life, should be your pleasure. In other words, what matters to you most is what you want, what the heart desires. And he says that the repression of those desires is the basis of all neurosis, or the beginning of all negative internal stress and thinking. In other words, if you don't follow your heart, if you don't follow your desires, if you don't follow your path, it's the beginning to a negative state of being. Therefore, you should go after what you want. In other words, culture says, so follow your heart. They're saying the best way to live is about getting what you want. And come on, you know this is true. Like we talked about last week, all marketing and advertising, it all exists so that you can choose what you believe, not based on what is real, but what is attractive to you. It's all about your feelings. So follow your heart. And now our world and our culture and our psychology is filled with the idea that I don't need to decipher, ready, what is right in life. All, everything around you is screaming at you that there's this truth that you don't need to know what is right in life. You don't need to know what is an ultimate authority in life. I don't need to know what is right in life. I just need to know what is right for me in life. Because at the end of the day, my primary pursuit should be my pleasure, my heart, my desires, my wants. So right and wrong no more exists in my moral compass. My moral compass exists to say what is right for me. So follow your heart. Follow your path. 
But if you can't tell from my tone, this is a massive, massive problem. This idea is a massive problem because this idea of follow your heart doesn't line up with the ugly truth about our hearts that God shows us, that God tells us. And so one of God's prophets in the Old Testament, his name is Jeremiah, someone who would have spoken with God and then taken that message and spoken it out to the people. Look at what he says about your heart and why following it and why what Steve Jobs is saying, that they'll somehow, your heart is gonna tell you what you really wanna become. Look at what Jeremiah actually says about your heart. He says, the heart is deceitful above all things and it's beyond cure. Other translations say that it's desperately sick. It's beyond cure. It's beyond repair. Who can understand it? So if my guide in life is to follow my heart, but all of scripture says, no, 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 your heart is deceitful. Who can understand it? Then there's a tension here. My world, my culture, my life around me is telling me one thing, but my Jesus, my ultimate authority is telling me another thing. And so does follow your heart become the way that I live? And can I just explain real fast of why this is a problem? Because this is exactly what the enemy knows you're going to go to first. See, the enemy knows that you're gonna believe you wanna follow your heart first, but he also knows that your heart is the thing he can deceive the most. Because what he does is he gives you a deceptive idea that plays on your distorted desires in your heart. He doesn't give you a deceptive idea about something that means nothing to you. You're not tempted by that. He gives you a deceptive idea around your distorted desire. And the moment he does that, you know what he never screams at you? If you look at the story of Eve and you think about these three paths that you have, in the story of Genesis 3, you got Jesus' way that you can follow, you got my way, you got Satan's way. If you look at these three paths, you know what we never see the enemy say? Anywhere ever, he never actually says it. When he, messes, when he tempts Eve to eat the fruit and break the rule, when he tempts Jesus in the Gospels before Jesus begins his ministry, Jesus spends 40 days in the wilderness fasting and praying and spending time with God. And then after that, the enemy shows up to tempt him with three overwhelming things that speak to his, his desires. But the entire time he tempts, the entire time that he sits there and throws lies, you know what he never says? He never says, follow me. The enemy never tells Eve, hey, don't follow God, follow me. Follow the path of Satan. Why doesn't he say that? Because no one's going for that. He's too cunning, he's too wily, he's too shrewd, he's too sly. He knows you too well. And he's never like, hey, here's a whole bunch of darkness and your life's gonna suck. You wanna choose this side? No one ever takes that. Instead, he deceives us and he gives us this lie and this image of here's what it's gonna be and then every single time it ends up in our death even though we think it's going to be our life. See, what the enemy does is he was trying to get Eve not to choose his path, but to choose her path. The enemy is trying to get Eve to choose my path. I know that you said that God told you you shouldn't do that. But did he really say? I mean, you can eat it if you want. Look at it. Doesn't it look good? Isn't it desirable for food? It's going to give you wisdom. It's going to open your eyes. You're going to see the way that God sees. Don't you want that? The temptation was never for her to follow the enemy. It was for her to stop following God and following her path because the enemy knows that when he gets you to follow your path, he's got you. See, the lie that he's telling you is the exact same lie that culture is telling you. It's the exact same lie that the world is telling you is that your path is what you need to choose. But the deception that he's not telling you and what culture's not telling you and then what the world is not telling you is that my way is Satan's way. There is no my way in life. The entire deception is that Eve, you can do what you wanna do. You can find your own truth. You can go and live it up and be free and do whatever you wanna do because you don't have to trust God. But the moment she does that, he's got her. She's here. So are you. It's nothing that you can avoid. It's nothing you can do about it. 
Because at the end of the day, what he's, going, what he's trying to do is to steal and kill and destroy everything that God is trying to build in your life. You think that I can just do, there's paint all over me, guys. I'm not bleeding, okay? <laughs> Chill out. I'm like, he wrote Satan's way and then he made him bleed. No, this is just, it's paint and it's not on my clothes. <laughs> the moment that I think I can just live out my own truth, I can find my own thing, I can, you ready? I can follow my heart my deceitful heart, I'm living a lie. I'm living a lie because the enemy has deceived me, whether you're aware of it or not, he has deceived you into going away from what God would want for you. And so what you're allowing him to do is to steal and to kill and to destroy the life that is available to you by following God. God wants to give you a more and better life than you could ever dream of, but it's a life that is only found in following him, in following his authority, in following his rules, because he knows you and he wants what's best for you. How do you know that he wants what's best for you? How do you know you can trust him? How do you know that he loves you? This is the lie that we talked about last week with that replacement principle, because he gave his life up for you. Because he sent Jesus here to die for you so that when you choose to follow him, you can experience the life that he offers, the full, full life, real and eternal life. It's now, it is on earth as it is in heaven, now and forever in heaven. That only happens though when you follow God's plan, when you follow God's way, when you follow what Jesus says. So if you're living a life where you're constantly letting you be your own authority in life, you are actually following what the enemy wants. There is no choice. There's no condition. There's no, I get to choose. It's that binary. It's one or the other. And when you choose to follow Jesus' way, you are choosing to follow the way of life because it's what Jesus said himself. When Jesus showed up here, he started to tell people about what life looks like and how they don't anymore need to follow all the rules to get to him, that he did everything to come down to them. And the moment they follow him, he's gonna give them something they're never gonna find on their own. Their culture can't provide it, their religion can't provide it, their nation can't provide it, their beliefs can't provide it, their ideology can't provide it, because he looks at them, and in John chapter 14, here's what he says. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. It's Jesus' way or no way. And there are so many of us who gain all this insight about God and about what we believe about Jesus. We gain all this knowledge, but we still choose to live for our path because simply believing in Jesus, y'all need to listen to this one because you get it twisted so many times. Simply believing in Jesus alone is not what he calls you to do. A few weeks ago, I taught in another environment and one of the things I said when I was talking about forgiveness is I said that you can't be a follower of Jesus and repeatedly refuse to forgive somebody. And afterwards, someone came up to me and they were like, hey, when you said that thing, I don't really know, like, I had a hard time with that. I don't know that I believe that. And I was like, yeah, I, I really believe you can't repeatedly refuse to forgive someone and actually be a follower of Jesus. And he was like, okay, so do you mean, though, that you can't be a believer or you mean you can't be a follower? And I was like, there is no category. There is no difference. James 2.19 says, even the demons believe and they shudder. Even Satan believes that Jesus is who he is. It's why he tries to take him out. And he does everything he can to go the other direction. Simply believing or not is not the goal and it is not enough and it is not gonna give you a full life. It's not whether you believe or not, it's whether you follow or not and it's who you follow. And we are all constantly being tempted and being deceived into following my own path instead of God's path. But Jesus speaks to this. He speaks to the danger that awaits us if we stay on this path. And I have a friend of mine who this verse, he said, is one of the verses that made him realize and go from just belief to following because of how much it shook him. 
And so maybe there's some of you who walk in here with doubts. You walk in here with belief, but maybe as you evaluate really quick your life and your decisions and the fact that your devotion doesn't match your decisions and so your life isn't following Jesus' path, you'd hear these words that Jesus is about to say and have the exact same response that my friend did. Because my friend gave his life to Jesus after he read what Jesus said. And here, I want you to read it in the, in the message version. Eugene Peterson takes the translation and puts it in our words for us to be able to understand. Look what he says in Matthew chapter seven. Jesus is speaking. This is the Sermon on the Mount. He's got people gathered around telling them how to live the best possible life. This is what you should do. And then he goes into this little dissertation about what people believe and where they get it wrong when it comes to the path they choose in life. Look what he says. He says, knowing the correct password saying, master, master. And Eugene Peterson uses the word master for Jesus because he says that what I'm supposed to do if I follow Jesus is give my life to him. He is my master. I do what he says, not what I want. What he says, not what I want. And so he uses this word for Jesus. He says, knowing the correct password, this is Jesus speaking, saying, master, master, for instance, it isn't going to get you anywhere with me. What is required is serious obedience, doing what my father wills, that's Jesus' path, Jesus' way. And Jesus then goes into this image. So imagine, imagine you're sitting there listening to Jesus cast this picture. He says, I can see it now. At the final judgment, at the end of time, thousands strutting up to me, strutting up, like, like given that, uh, what is it, the like, notorious like, billionaire thing? Like, you know what I mean? Uh, what's his name? Who's the fighter? So, yes, McGregor. You know what I'm saying? strutting up so confident, like, hey, what up, Jesus? Showing up, feeling like I've done it right because of how much I know and what I've done. Strutting up to me saying, Master, we preached the message and we bashed the demons and our super spiritual projects had everyone talking. And Jesus is like, uh-huh. And you know what, do you know what I'm gonna say? Do you know what I'm gonna say? To those people who do that, those people who come up with all this confidence about what they've done, I'm gonna say, uh-uh, you missed the boat. Other translations say, you might say, Lord, Lord, but I'll say, I never knew you because all you did was use me to make yourselves important. You don't impress me one bit. You're out of here. If this doesn't wake you up to the reality of the life that you're choosing and the fact that you can sit here and know all about Jesus but still be living for yourself first, and Jesus is saying, you're not hot, not for me, but you're also not cold, like you're not running away, you're lukewarm. And that lukewarm living, I want none of it. I didn't come and give up my life for you to live lukewarm, for you to still follow your path, regardless of what you know about me. There's this guy, John Ortberg, who's a mentor of John Mark Comer's. I actually got to listen to him talk today. And one of the things that he says in one of his books called Eternity is Now in Session, talking about the way of Jesus and finding that, that kingdom culture life, that Jesus path life. Here's what he writes in that book. He says, Jesus said, follow me and you'll be my disciples. This is in Matthew. In other words, if you choose to follow me, you'll come to know me. If you do not choose to follow me, it doesn't really matter what you say you believe about me. What matters most to Jesus is not that I'm a believer about him. It's that I'm a follower of him. He called people to make following him. He called for people to make following him the center of their lives. And whether you know it or not, even if tonight's the first time you've become aware of it, you can live this way for a long, 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 long time. But there is a drift, there is a tendency, there is a deceitfulness of your own heart that over time you will be tempted not to come all the way over here and deconstruct your faith or to walk away from faith or to think he doesn't exist anymore. I have friends that have done that. That is a possibility. But most of the time what the enemy does, he's not trying to get you to go here. He's just trying to get you to drift to here. And so you have to be aware of really what's at the center of your life. I'll be honest with y'all. 
This isn't an easy story to tell. I've been in ministry for 14 years. Uh, started right out of college, 22 years old. I had someone ask me if I wanted to come and be his intern. It was a hero of mine, a role model, like a big brother. And it was like, let me pray about that. Yes. I mean, so easy. Such an easy decision of what I would do. I knew from when I was 17 that I was going to go into ministry. I just didn't know how. But as I've looked back over this last probably year of my life, and God has been awakening some things to me, revealing some things to me, helping me understand a lot about me and about what I'm actually doing, the hard reality that I've had to admit, I admit it to my counselor. So A, if you're not in counseling because you feel like it's weak, no, it's not. You are. You need counseling. You need help. You need a coach. I'm going to one all the time. Healthy people get help. And then they get to help people. So as I'm sitting there with my counselor, he's like, what do you think the source of this season you're in, this difficulty you're going through, all these insecurities that I've been wrestling with the last like nine months of my life? Basically, right before I came into TLR last spring, all the way through this current season, what are those insecurities? What's the source of them? What do you think it really comes from? And for about three minutes, I sat there and I looked at him on the screen. So we're on Zoom. And I was like, I know the answer. I... I just don't want to say it. <laughs> you ever had that happen? You're like, I know the truth. I just, the, maybe the longer I don't say it, the longer it's not real. Like, yeah, I can, I'm just going to hide it here. And then it's not really, yet. yeah, I get there's an elephant behind me, but I'm just not, don't, don't look at the elephant, look at me. I had one of those moments on Zoom and I was like, I, I know what I have to say. I know the problem. I figured it out. It's just so hard to say. I had to sit there and look at him and confess what I've realized is that Jesus has been a means to an ends for me the last 14 years of ministry. Jesus was not the ends of me doing this. It wasn't for his glory. It wasn't for his name. I did all of these things so that he could be seen and to help people find him. But if I dig down real deep at the core source of why I did so much of what I did the last 14 years and really what I did so much of what I did for my entire life is because I had insecurities that flared up constantly and I wanted to be affirmed. I wanted people to tell me how good I did. I wanted people to look at me and tell me they were proud of me. I wanted people to be impressed by me. And so if I look at the source of even why I did ministry, it wasn't really here. It was really here. Other people may not have come into contact with that. Other people may not have seen that. But when I got super honest, a lot of it was here. It wasn't really out of him. He wasn't enough for me. He wasn't my sustenance. He wasn't my prize. He wasn't my joy. He wasn't my identity. At the end of the day, I was trying to feed something about me from everyone around me instead of the source within me. And so I had to confess. Jesus. I've been making you a means to my ends, but no more. I'm done with lukewarm living. I'm done with getting it right. I'm done with putting you in the wrong place. And so I realigned my life back here. See, we're all susceptible to this, every one of us. And so we have to do something about it. We have to do something to get where it is we wanna be. We can't follow our hearts because our hearts are deceitful. Our hearts are always gonna pull us back into my path, which is ultimately the enemy's path. It's not God's way. It's not what Jesus wants for you. And so what do you do? What can you actually do? What, what is something that you can do within your heart to be able to follow Jesus more, to be able to follow Jesus better, to be able to say, I'm gonna surrender everything that I have to Jesus. And I think what we often do is we think, Again, I, like I was inspired by this piece this morning when John Ortberg said this in that room. He said, you gotta quit trying and you gotta start training. We think that we need to follow our heart. Just, fo just follow, follow your heart. That's what you should do. Like, no, that's the dumbest thing that you could do if you wanna live the best possible life. Don't follow your heart because your heart will deceive you. Instead of following your heart, what you need to do is you need to train your heart to follow Jesus. Train your heart to follow Jesus. Get control of your heart instead of allowing your heart to control you. Now, how can you train your heart to do this? You gotta begin to trust him as your ultimate authority and then obey what he says because he's your ultimate authority. People got this right so long ago. There's this old hymn 
where they just consistently sing this idea of trusting and obeying. Maybe you heard it if you got grandparents who grew up in church, maybe. I heard it on this little cartoon for my kids, and I haven't seen it again since, but, it, but I, saw, I heard it one time, and I remembered it. It's called Trust and Obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. That's it. And I'm like, they cracked the code. That's it. That's the song that opens the gate. That's the thing I need to get to the next level. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. That's probably not even on key. It doesn't matter. You trust and you obey. <laughs> trust and obey. And then when I trust him, and then I put my obedience into following him, I start to put it into practice. Now, how do you practice following Jesus? You do what he said. What did he say for you to do? He tells you. He says, if you want to be a follower of me, all those rules you had before, they're all summed up in one. I'm going to give you one command. It's like the garden all over again. I'm going to give you one rule, one command, one thing you are supposed to do if you want to be a follower of Jesus. If you want to follow Jesus' way for your life, here it is. He says in John 13, 34, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Go and love on people the way that Jesus loved you. That means you forgive people. That means you give them a second chance. That means you serve them. That means you give yourself up for them. That means that one day, whenever you get married, you get into a submission competition and you try to outserve the other person. That means when you see a stranger out on the street who needs something, you go and fill that need. Because Jesus says, if, I, if you see someone who's hungry and you feed them, you're feeding me. If you see someone who's thirsty, you give them drink, you're giving me drink. You see someone who needs shelter, shelter and you give them shelter, you're giving me shelter. What you do to the least of these, you do unto me. And so then you train yourself in these practices. You give yourself opportunities to go love on people because the moment you love on others, you can't be about you first. Biblical love is an act of the will accompanied by emotion that leads to action on behalf of its object. That's the way of Jesus. And so you have to train yourself. And you're like, I don't like to train. I don't like to sweat. I don't like to do any of that. Well, let me ask you a question so that you can understand. How many of you in this room right now, show of hands, could run every single step of a marathon? Show your hand, raise your hand. Right, go ahead, raise your hand. Raise your, uh, okay, Gene, that's a lie. You are not, Jordan, Jordan, I believe it. You run triathlons, good job. You can do it, okay. Three out of the 400 of y'all can run every step of a marathon right now. How many of you think, with all the willpower in the world and you tried your hardest that actually you probably could run like 95% of all those steps in a marathon. So, okay, a few more hands. A little overconfident. Now watch, you ready? If I said you had time to train for a marathon, you had enough time as you needed, how many of you think that one day eventually you could run a marathon? Show hands. All of us. We have to train to get where we want to be. And our willpower alone isn't going to get us there. It's a habit that we build because following Jesus isn't about trying, it's about training. Or as John Ortberg said today, habits eat willpower for breakfast. So what habits can you build into your life of following Jesus? What spiritual disciplines can you begin having? What prayer, what silence what solitude. Maybe you go and find that podcast, The Rules of Life. You start listening to it. You start practicing Sabbath in your life. Maybe for you, all it simply means is that every day you wake up and you prioritize Jesus first. Instead of fitting everything into my day, all in this little bag, I'm gonna pull all of it out and I'm gonna put Jesus in first and allow that to put everything else into what should be in my bag for my day. Prioritize Jesus first in your day. When you do that, that's a practice. And then you're gonna be tired and sleep and you're gonna mess up. Great, it's training. Get back on it the next day. And then the moment you do that, what you are allowing yourself to do is to become someone who's so confident in who Jesus says I am, not who the world says I gotta try to be, and not who the enemy's trying to deceive me into being. I am confident in who Jesus says I am. So now I don't need affirmation from other people. Now I don't need anything from anybody. And the moment I don't need anything from anybody, I'm freed up to be for everybody. 
So when you start living for Jesus and putting this into practice, your life changes and you start living the best possible life. And some of you are like, but that seems like still a big step. I don't really know. Let me give you a very practical, very easy way that every person in this room, regardless of where you are on the faith spectrum, regardless of how much you got that down, every one of you can do something here at TLR to make a massive impact and show the world who Jesus is. Clay and Lauren talked about Be Rich at the very beginning. When you came in, you saw the piano. Alex, were you playing piano at that point? I wish you were. Alex is gonna play piano later, okay? He's incredible at it, our intern. You saw the Be Rich stuff. You see all the colors. Our church has this massive initiative right now, Woodstock City Church and all of our campuses, this massive initiative to go and love on the community around us, to love on the world around us, to love on the people around us, to go and find the least of these and do what we can to serve them. And we have an opportunity here at TLR to serve people who are in need in this community. And you're like, I don't know if I can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Because what we have an opportunity to do is to go and love on and help out four foster families here in the Cherokee County area by simply arranging their garage or cleaning up and kind of organizing their room so that the children who come in can have a safe place to be. We're gonna get to build a playground for some of them. How fun is that gonna be? We get to go to Goshen Valley, this incredible place we partner with where all these boys in at-risk situations get to have a place of reprieve and respite and they get to go into retreat and have a safe place to figure out this season of life. And we get to go do their landscaping. We get to make it look like it's a place that they belong. This is not hard to do to go and love on other people. And we at TLR get to do it. And every one of y'all can do that. It's coming up next weekend. And I'm gonna talk more about it in just a minute, but I need you to understand how simple and easy this is. Because the way of Jesus is not meant to be difficult. Now, don't get that mixed up. It is going to cost you. This is not a cheap grace. This is not a grace that doesn't require some repentance. It's not a grace that doesn't require forgiveness. It's not a grace that doesn't require you clean up some stuff. But it's also a grace that the cost of that means that you come to Jesus so that he can clean you up because it's not all on you. It means that you may have to repent from some things. It may mean you gotta change some things. It may mean you gotta reevaluate and figure out, okay, this isn't the life that I ultimately want, but I wanna follow and find the best possible life. So Jesus, if I can trust what you really say, then I'm gonna start living that out. But it's not meant to be difficult. He says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Come and find freedom. And we get to do that together. But at the end of the day, it just comes down to, it's not about trying. It's about training. And it's not about following your heart. It's about training your heart to follow Jesus. And I believe that every one of you can do that. But it's your choice. So let me pray for us. And then we'll talk about how we can do that. It's TLR. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you want more for us than we may even be aware of. Thank you that you want more for our life and more in this life for us than we even know. But Jesus, I pray that whatever, whatever we talked about today, this reality of following your path and not our heart, following what you want and not what we want, putting you first in our life, that may require some things from the students in this room. That may require that they give some things up. That may require that they change some mindsets. That may require they reprioritize and realign some things in their day. I just ask, Lord, that you would meet them in those moments. You'd give them grace in those moments and that you would keep pushing them along closer to you. Because at the end of the day, what they're trying to find is you. So would you be at the center of our lives? Would you be glorified in our lives? And would you see our lives and run alongside us, helping us and guiding us to find the more and better life than we could ever dream of? So thank you for giving that to us freely. And thank you for loving us, not because of what we've done, but in spite of it. Thank you for loving us first. We love you right back. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So a few things. I wanna tell you about how we can do Be Rich, but before, before we kind of go, if y'all have liked this series, if y'all like this series, this has been good, good learning. So we got some stickers with the little snake and the megaphone on there um, to remind you everything we've been talking about. So on your way out, we got these stickers uh, of the series graphic that if you'd like to grab one, we've got some out there. They may be a little limited, so you may need to grab one if you really want that. But we'd love for you to have that as you leave. Um, another thing about this series, if I can just talk real fast. 
A lot of things have probably come up for a lot of you in this series that may feel a little emotional, may feel a little difficult. There may have been some things you've been believing, some lies you've been following, and you may just feel like I need some help. Um, Two things I wanna offer to you. First is, here at Woodstock City, we have a care team, a care department, that has all of the resources possible that you could need to get over that hump or to find the help or to get the counseling. And so on our website, they're gonna show a little picture where you can go. If you go to woodstockcity.org slash care, on the website, they've got everything we offer from money-wise for financial training to care to, to immediate crisis things. Everything that you could need is there. So if you feel like I just want some further help, there is no shame in that. If you feel like I don't need that, you're probably deceived, as I explained earlier. So go there and find the help that you need. It is available to you as a resource. But uh, afterwards, when you go out from here, we are gonna get an opportunity to sign up for something. And so rather than me telling you more about it, I wanna bring out someone who works with them. So Mercy, come here, where are you at? Y'all get up for Mercy. Hey, everyone. Hey. Say, say hey, Mercy. There we go. This hey is Mercy. Uh, so Mercy is an intern here in Woodstock City, and she works with our Fostering Together uh, team as an intern. And so she knows a little bit about what Fostering Together is and the projects we're going to get to do. And so I want to bring Mercy out to tell you a little bit about what that is and what we're going to get to do next Saturday. So tell us. Yeah, so basically Fostering Together is just an organization that we have here at the church and all the other campuses. And basically, we just support our foster, adoptive, kinship, and kinship is like grandma taking custody over. Um, and we support them with meal support, supporting mentors, uh, respite, um, and so much more. Uh, we provide a community for them, and this church does a really great job at doing that. Yeah, that's, that was very succinct. Yeah. I, I wish I could talk as fast as you did. I need to, I need to learn from you. I go real long. Um, so yes, yeah, so what we're gonna get to do, and Mercy knows a lot of the information on this, is next Saturday, October the 29th, here at TLR, we are going to serve all around the community. These, there are four families we're gonna get to serve with different projects that they've asked us to be able to help with. And so what we need, here's what we need, is we need about 80 to 100 of you to sign up. Now that's about 20% of this room I bet more than that of you could actually sign up. And if you're online, you're watching, you're watching later, you can sign up as well. The way that you sign up to actually jump on board with us to be able to help is you can go to this QR code that they'll put up on the screen. There's also a QR code on the back of your chair. If you wanna go to that QR code, you're gonna be able to find a link where you can sign up to serve at one of these projects. So what time, do you know the time of the projects? I don't know the time, but I could tell you like a little bit of what we're doing. That would be great. Tell us that. Okay, so we have three different projects. I know one is organization in a garage for, and these are three different foster families. And another one, we're redecorating um, one of our foster, single foster mom's whole living room and all that, and dining room. And, then the, and we're doing her backyard as well, and we're doing another backyard. Yeah. Along with that. So there are four projects we want to do. Each of those projects is going to have an opportunity for you to serve. Um, if, if you're like someone who's super handy, guy or a girl, and you're like, I would love to build something, there's gonna be some Ikea things to do with the garage. There's gonna be a playground to build in one of the houses. There are projects for you to serve. If you're like, I don't know how to build anything, but I can push a lawnmower or I can spread some, some pine straw, great, we're gonna go to Goshen Valley and do that as well. So I would love to see over 100 of you sign up because again, this is how you live that out, that practice in your life of actually doing it. And then the last thing is our Global X trip to Texas in May. This is the final week to sign up. You can also go to the QR code to be able to do that. It's the last week. Uh, we got about a dozen of you already signed up. The application fee's been waived and pushed back. We'd love for you to sign up for that. It's an incredible way to give yourself away. Y'all say thanks to Mercy. Yeah. She's the best. Um, and yeah, on your way out, grab a sticker. Y'all sign up for these things. Be rich next Saturday. It'll be from nine to three o'clock. We'd love for y'all to be there. Thanks for hanging out. We'll see you here next week. Oh, and a little surprise. Samer's with us next week, so y'all gotta come hang out and tell Samer hey. Passing up on my ways, I can't No, no. Passionate from miles away, passive at the things you say. Passing up on my ways.